What we're going to try and do now is consider the classical pain pathway. And the pain pathway goes from the nociceptor where the pain is generated all the way up to the brain where the pain is experienced and very often where the pain is localized. So let's think of an example in the, in the skin. <clears throat> so here we've got the surface of the skin. That's the epidermis, the top layer. The wavy junction between the epidermis and the dermis below. Now the epidermis actually doesn't contain nociceptors, but the dermis certainly does. And as we've said, the nociceptors are free nerve endings running through tissues. So here we have some free nerve endings running through the tissues of the dermis. Free nerve endings. And these free nerve endings are the nociceptors. So the nociceptors are the nerve endings themselves. And when the insult to the tissue is bad enough to start damaging the tissues, there will be transduction in these nociceptors and they will generate new nerve impulses. So obviously if the tissue is bashed or traumatized, that can cause pain. Cutting or tearing is very painful because it's going to cut or tear through the nociceptors. If the tissue becomes too hot or indeed too cold, that's going to cause pain as well. And the other thing that can cause pain, as well as these mechanical insults, as well as the thermal insults, are chemical insults. So I don't know if you ever cut yourself, maybe in the kitchen, and got some vinegar or some salt in the wound. It's very painful because chemicals can also stimulate the nociceptors to depolarize, producing new nerve impulses. Maybe you've been stung by a bee or a wasp. And you know how painful that can be because of the chemical effect <clears throat> on the nociceptors. So here we have these nociceptors. And of course the nociceptors have to be connected to the nervous system in some way. So <clears throat> this group of nociceptors is connected to a nerve fibre. And this nerve fibre will go off towards the brain. Now, these are free nerve endings, and this is the nerve fibre. So obviously, we're going to need a cell body somewhere. And in these sensory neurons, which are afferent neurons, afferent neuron is a neuron which takes information towards the central nervous system. So sensory neurons are going to be afferent. The converse is efferent. Motor neurons are efferent, they take impulses out of the central nervous system. But here we're dealing with afferent neurons taking impulses towards the central nervous system. They're going to need a cell body. And these cell bodies are going to be over here. And they're going to be on like a, a side branch of the nerve fibre. So here's the cell body of the sensory neuron. As we would expect, it's got a nucleus and a cytoplasm and a cell membrane. Now, the nerve impulse is generated here in the nociceptor and is going to travel in this direction towards the cell body. And any nerve fibre carrying information towards a cell body, by definition, we call a dendrite. So a dendrite is any nerve fibre carrying information towards the cell body in the form of a nerve impulse, this wave of depolarization going along the nerve fibre, in this case the dendrite. But then, <clears throat> when it's been to the cell body, this is going to go off, still carrying the nerve impulse a bit further on, as we'll see in a minute. And this fibre here is going to be carrying the information away from the cell body and any nerve fibre carrying a nerve impulse away from the cell body we refer to as an axon. So nociceptor, dendrite, cell body, axon.
axon. And these cell bodies of the sensory neurons are all together. They're very near the spinal cord and they're in an area called the dorsal root ganglia. The DRG. The dorsal root ganglia. Now this is the dorsal root because all nerve fibres that go into the spinal cord go in the back and the back is the dorsal surface, the posterior surface is the dorsal surface. So they're going in the back of the spinal cord. So remember, all sensory impulses go in the back of the spinal cord and all motor ones come out the front. So it's always in the back door, out the front door. That's the way it works. So these are afferent sensories, so they're going in the back. The efferent motor are going to go out of the front. And because it's the back, it's the dorsal surface. So this is the dorsal root. This is the dorsal root, the back way in. And a ganglia actually means a collection of nerve cell bodies. So there'll be many of these nerve cell bodies together at the level of any one of the spinal nerves. Now, you might remember that some axons and dendrites are myelinated. Myelin sheaths in the peripheral nervous system are made out of what sort of cells? Do you remember the sort of cells that make up the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system? You know in the central nervous system it's oligodendrocytes. But what is it in the peripheral nervous system? Well, in the peripheral nervous system, they're called Schwann cells that make up this fatty myelin sheath, the Schwann cells. So the Schwann cells are going to, individual Schwann cells are going to surround lengths of the nerve fibre. And they wrap around the nerve fibre. They've got a nucleus, of course, because they are, the Schwann cells are individual cells. And they're going to wrap around the nerve fibre like this. So here we see individual Schwann cells. Collectively, they're going to compose the myelin sheath that insulates, protects, nourishes the nerve fibres. And also, the presence of the myelin sheath facilitates saltatory transmission of the nerve impulse. Saltatory conduction. And you might remember that saltatory conduction is very rapid. In the case of these particular sort of nerve fibres, which are called A-delta fibres, these are actually A-delta fibres, the speed of transmission is, is the textbooks normally say 6 to 30 metres per second. So 20, 30 metres per second, so it's quite quick, it goes along really quickly, the nerve impulse. But the reason it's so quick is there is saltatory transmission, which is a kind of bouncing transmission. What happens is the um, impulse bounds from one node. These are called the nodes of Ramvia, the neurofibral nodes. I guess nodes of Ramvia is a, Ramvia is a bit old-fashioned now. The neurofibral nodes. The impulse bounces from one to the next very quickly. Boing, boing, boing. So it goes, do, 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 and it gets it's really quick, fast transmission in A-delta fibres. And this is important because if the skin is starting to be damaged, tissue damage is going to occur, and we've got to get our hand pulled away before we get serious damage to the tissues, because we do not want damage to our tissues. So the pain has to be generated or the reflex stimulated quickly. So this has got to go fast. This goes fast. Rapid saltatory transmission. And when this pain actually gets to the brain, which it does very quickly, it gets to the brain quickly, there can be reflex withdrawal before that. But when it actually gets to the brain, this pain is described as sharp pain. It is sharp and well-localised. It's like a pinprick pain. 
and we know where it is, we can tell what part of the body it's in, we can take effective action to withdraw it. So A delta fibres, fast saltatory transmission, giving rise to sharp, well localised pain. But very often, after you've, after you've experienced a sharp, well localised pain, you get kind of an ache. So you might get a, a sharp pain and think, oh, yeah, you know, that still hurts. It aches. You get achy pain. And achy pains are often more diffuse, sometimes called dull pains. So you get dull, achy pains as well. So what is the physiological anatomical basis of these dull achy type of pains, the more diffuse pains. You might not be able to say exactly where it is. You know, you can sometimes say, oh, it hurts round here or it hurts round here. It's, it's an area of ache. What's giving rise to these? Well, the answer is a completely different type of nerve fibre. So here we have another nociceptor, just the same as in the A-delta fibre. And this nociceptor is also connected to a dendrite just as the other one was. Also connected to a cell body in the dorsal root ganglia. Also with an axon. But these fibres are not myelinated and they tend to be fairly thin fibres. Now the two factors which increase neuronal transmission the two factors which makes the nerve impulse go fast, the first factor is the diameter of the axon. Sorry, dendrites in this case, isn't it? The diameter of the nerve fiber. Wider diameter means faster transmission. The more important second factor is the presence of the myelin sheath facilitating the saltatory transmission. So these C fibers tend to be thinner. I've just said the C fibers, they're called C fibers. So these are A-delta fibres, these are C-fibres. The C-fibres tend to be thinner and they're not myelinated, therefore the rate of transmission is slow. That's why the sharp pain comes first, because it's fast, and then the ache, the more diffuse pain, comes second. And the rate of neuronal transmission in these can be as slow as 0.5 metres per second. So 0.5 to 1 metre, even up to 2 metres per second. Those kind of rates of transmission. So we can have the A-delta fibres transmitting at 30 metres per second. The C fibres, the unmyelinated fibres, incapable of saltatory transmission, as slow as 0.5 metres per second, meaning the ache is perceived later. But the C fibres, for reasons we'll see later, the pain tends to persist for longer. So the sharp pain hopefully comes and goes quickly. The ache from the C fibre persists for a longer period of time. Now, <coughs> nociceptors can be hyperalgesic. So if there's inflammation going on here and there's inflammatory chemicals, prostaglandins for example, bradykinin causes a lot of pain, that's an inflammatory mediator. If you inject bradykinin into, a, into someone they really really don't like it at all, it, it stimulates the nociceptors massively. Substance P is another inflammatory mediator. Substance P is a, is a short protein, polypeptide, that's why it's called substance P. So if there's inflammatory mediators here, if there's inflammation, I'll tell you a good example of this, sunburn. If you've got sunburn, it really hurts to touch it. You can't bear to have clothes on it because the nociceptors are bathed in these inflammatory mediators and there's a hyperalgesia. So just any little stimulus to the hyperalgesic inflamed tissues is going to cause a lot of pain. That's because the inflammatory mediators increase the sensitivity of the nociceptors. They make transduction of a new nerve impulse more likely. <clears throat> they do this by lowering the depolarization threshold. <clears throat> so hyperalgesia. Alternatively, you could give drugs such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, 
And these work by reducing the production of inflammatory mediators, particularly prostaglandins. So if you give non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that's going to inhibit the formation of prostaglandins. If you don't have the prostaglandins and the other inflammatory mediators, you're not going to lower the depolarization of the nociceptors. So you're going to reduce the hyperalgesia. That's why non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are analgesic. They have an analgesic effect. They reduce the amount of pain. So there can be hyperalgesia here as a result of inflammation, or you can reduce the amount of um, algesia here by giving analgesics, drugs which reduce the amount of pain. And the ones that particularly affect this initial transduction of the painful stimulus are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And while we're at this level, it's very worth thinking about, worth thinking about local anaesthetic drugs. Now we've said that the nerve impulse is propagated as a wave of depolarization. So what we have in the um, membranes of the nerves is there's little, there's little um, pores, little uh, ionophores, where ions can go in and out. Because as you probably know, when a nerve impulse is at rest, when there's no wave of depolarization, the nerves are going to be negative inside and positive outside. But when a new nerve impulse is generated, that's going to change and it's going to be positive inside and negative outside. And this is going to spread as a wave of depolarization from the nociceptors where the depolarization is generated all the way along the nerve fiber. But this depends <coughs> on the ions going in and out from inside the nerve fibre here to outside of the nerve fibre to alter the electrochemical potential across the cell membrane. And one ion that's absolutely crucial in this, of course, is the sodium ion. The distribution of the sodium ions, which is positive, is going to alter the polarity across the cell membrane. So the propagation of the nerve impulse depends on the ability of sodium ions to go in and out of the cell membrane. Now local anaesthetics like lignocaine, which are based on cocaine, what those local anaesthetics do is they block these iron channels. They block them. So there we see a molecule of lignocaine blocking up the iron channel. They're blocked. So the nociceptors can generate new nerve impulses as usual, but if there's an area of the afferent neuron that's bathing lignocaine, That area, all the sodium channels are going to be blocked, so the nerve impulse cannot propagate because the lignocaine, as we see here, is blocking them. So there will be depolarization generated here because the dentist is trying to pull your tooth out or you're trying to sew up a wound. That is going to start going along the afferent dendrites, but when it gets to the point where you've put in a nerve block with your local anaesthetic, the wave of depolarization stops there. It won't go along there. <clears throat> so I was recently at the dentist. I was completely conscious. The dentist was pulling out one of my teeth. It wasn't very nice. There was a bit of pushing and pulling, but it was amazing. There was no pain. There was no pain. Just think how much pain would be generated in the nociceptors. Immense amounts of pain, but it was completely blocked by, by the local anaesthetic. Absolutely marvelous. So, peripheral pain physiology, application with non-steroidals, inflammation and hyperalgesia, and uh, local anaesthetics acting as nerve blocks. So the pain is going along towards the central nervous system. Now, as you probably know, <clears throat> the brain communicates with the body in two ways. 
you know about the 12 pairs of cranial nerves going directly to and from the brain and also via the 31 pairs of spinal nerves going via the spinal cord. So for this example we're going to assume that this is a uh, somatic from the lower part of the body <coughs> uh, pain and it's going via the spinal cord. So what we've looked at here is um, peripheral pain physiology. The next thing we want to look at is spinal cord level pain physiology. Now, here we have the uh, <coughs> spinal cord in cross-section. Cross-section of the spinal cord. And you probably know that the spinal cord contains two types of matter. It contains grey matter and it contains white matter. And the grey matter is more or less in an H-shaped bit inside like this. So we've got these eight-shaped bit in the spinal cord here. <clears throat> so what we have here is grey matter. I'll just shade it lightly grey so we know. That's the grey matter, eight-shaped. And of course this runs up and down in and out the plane of the picture. Actually the grey matter it's called grey matter because when anatomists sliced up spinal cords, they saw this was white and this was grey. But of course the spinal cords the anatomists were um, making cross-sections of were dead spinal cords. In life this is actually a pinkish colour. But what it means is the grey matter has got a lot of cell bodies, whereas the white matter has got a lot of nerve fibres. So the nerve fibres are running up and down through the plane of the picture like where my pen is now. And the reason it's white is that the nerve fibres contain a lot of um, myelin and the myelin, is, uh, the myelin is made out of fatty tissue so it looks white. And of course because the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system the myelin is actually made of oligodendrocytes in this case. So what happens now is let's look at the A delta fibre. The A delta fibre <coughs> is going, and this is the back here of course, it's going to go in the back and it goes into the, this part of the grey matter. Now this part of the grey matter is at the back, so this is the dorsal horn. This area here is the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. These would be the anterior or the ventral horns, but this is the dorsal horn and it's coming in. Now what happens is this first neuron terminates in the, it terminates there in the, uh, the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, the DH. This is the dorsal horn. So that's the first neuron finished its job. Now the next thing that happens is there's a synapse with another neuron, a secondary neuron. So the first neuron's done its job now, there's a secondary neuron there. Now we're not going to look at this process in detail just now, but we notice that a chemical transmitter is going to be released from the terminal part of the first neuron, diffuse across this synaptic gap, and depolarize the secondary neuron. And in fact, we'll mention now that this transmitter in the A-delta fibres is going to be glutamate. Glutamate is the chemical transmitter. So the electrical nerve impulse comes along the first neuron as an electrical stimulus. It causes the release of glutamate from the end of the first neuron. This glutamate diffuses across the synaptic gap. When the glutamate arrives at this postsynaptic membrane here, it's going to depolarize this postsynaptic membrane, generating a new nerve impulse. So there is chemical transduction of a new electrical nerve impulse in this secondary neuron as a result of the electrical impulse arriving from the first neuron, from the axon of the first neuron. Now in the case of the A-delta fibres, what happens now is this goes across the spinal cord like this. 
The posh name for this process is decusation. The nerve fibers decusate. They go from this side, which is the same side, the ipsilateral side is the same side. So they go from the ipsilateral side to the contralateral side. So ipsilateral, contralateral. They've gone on to the other side. And now that they're on the other side, they're at a particular level in the spinal cord. What they need to do now is go up the spinal cord to get to the brain. They've got to go up the spinal cord. So <clears throat> in this area of the spinal cord, and again, you've got to think of this running up and down the spinal cord. Here, there's a tract that goes from the spinal cord up to a part of the brain called the thalamus. So it's the spinothalamic tract. The spinothalamic tract. So this secondary neuron has gone across and it's entered this spinothalamic tract, running up and down the spinal cord. Because, of course, what it's got to do is go up. It's got to go up to get from a particular level in the spinal cord. So if it's coming at a level of the spinal cord about here, it's coming from somewhere here. To get to the brain, it's got to go up the spinal cord to get to the brain. It's obvious when you think about it. And this is called the spinothalamic tract because it goes from the brain, as we'll see, it goes to the thalamus. So next, this goes straight up the spinal cord. Now, this is hard to draw diagrammatically, but you've got to imagine it going straight up. So let's just draw it going straight up the spinal cord there like that. So this nerve fibre is ascending up the spinal cord in this spinothalamic tract. It's an ascending tract, taking the nerve impulse from the spinal cord now up towards the brain. Now, first of all, it goes through the, um, the brain stem. So here we have the, uh, the brain stem, like this. Actually, it'll go up on this side of the brain stem. So we've got the brain stem here, up the left side of the brain stem, up into the brain. And above the brain stem here, we have a nuclei in the brain. A nuclei in the brain is an area with a lot of nerve cells in it. And this nuclei in the brain is called the thalamus. The thalamus. Obviously, the thalamus is above the hypothalamus. So the ascending spinothalamic tract goes up the left side of the spinal cord, up the left side of the brainstem, towards the left thalamic nuclei. And it goes up into the thalamus. And in the thalamus, this second order neuron now terminates. So the impulse has arrived in the thalamus. Now, the way I understand this is so far this has just been a nerve impulse. But it, when it gets to the thalamus, the thalamus generates a pain. Sounds a bit strange. But if you think about it, you can see me now. You have vision. But to get from your eye to the visual cortex of your brain, well, that's just electrical activity, isn't it? It's only when it gets to the, the visual cortex of the brain, the occipital lobe of the brain, that vision is generated. So this electrical nerve impulse goes up to the thalamus and it gets to the thalamus. And it's the thalamus that generates a pain. So pain is generated in the thalamus. But of course there's bad pains, severe pains and less severe pains. It's not that we have a pain or we don't have a pain. There are orders of magnitude of pain. But as you know, an electrical nerve impulse is all or nothing. Either a nerve fibre generates an electrical nerve impulse or it does not generate a nerve impulse. You can't have half an impulse and you don't have weak impulses and strong impulses. So how come we can have some bad pains and some less bad pains? Well the answer is the nociceptors, if it's a bad pain, generate a lot of nerve impulses. The impulses are all the same strength, but it generates more of them. Whereas, whereas if a pain is not so bad, it will generate fewer nerve impulses. 
So a bad pain you're going to get a lot of nerve impulses going up to the brain. A not so bad pain you're going to get a lower frequency of nerve impulses. So the thalamus knows how much pain to generate by how many nerve impulses are arising from this ascending spinothalamic tract, but it terminates there. Now, can you see now we've got a pain, and there's a pain in the brain, but that's not much good to us unless we know where that pain is. We've got to localise the pain to part of the body. So if I'm trapping my finger in a door, it's no good my, pain, my brain saying, ooh, you've got pain, you've got pain. I need to know where that pain is so I can move the finger away or take some appropriate action. So how is the pain localised? Well, the answer is that higher up in the brain here, as you probably know, we have the sensory cortex. The sensory cortex is in the parietal lobe of the brain in an area called the post-central gyrus. And the body is represented in this post-central gyrus very roughly in an upside-down way. This is what we call the sensory homunculus. The body is represented in this sensory cortex of the parietal lobe in the post-central gyrus. So we had the spinothalamic tract taking, up to the, uh, taking the impulse up to the thalamus. What we need now is another set of nerve tracts, or in this case just one nerve fibre from this one example we're looking at, that takes it to a particular part of the sensory cortex. And this is called the thalmocortical neuron. Thalmus cortex, thalmocortical neuron. And what we see in this case is this patient's got a pain in their, one of their fingers or their thumb. So the pain has been localised. So if you like, one way to look at it is that the pain is generated in the thalamus the thalmocortical neuron takes it to the part of the body where that pain originated. And of course, the clever thing is that that relates to the position of the initial nociceptor. So now we have a pain taken to the part of the sensory cortex. And so we know that we have a pain in our finger, particularly in one part of the body, because the combination of the pain from the thalamus and the localization of that pain in the sensory cortex of the brain. So that is the classical fast pain pathway starting with the nociceptor and the A delta fibre going up to the up to the sensory cortex. Of course it's more complicated than this but this is the good this is a good way to start learning about pain. There's more neuron pathways that can be involved. Pain is actually described as a matrix. We've described a pain pathway here in reality, it's more of a matrix. But this is still true, and it's very useful to know about. Th these pathways do actually work. Now, the position with the C fibres is similar, but, but slightly different. Now, <clears throat> when a C fibre goes into the spinal cord, let's just draw another spinal cord here. Here's another spinal cord. Here's the grey matter. When a C fibre enters the spinal cord, so th th this, this one here is now entering the spinal cord, what the C fibres do is the C fibres actually terminate and then they synapse with a, another little neuron called a relay neuron or an interneuron. And then there's another nerve fibre that takes that across where it goes up to the brain as very similar ways before. But with the C fibre, you have these interneurons. And this is in an area of the dorsal horn called the, um, the it's a gelatinous layer. There's a, 
What actually happens is the spinal cord is divided into lamina. So there's like lamina, l l layers one, two, three, four, and five. And the substantia gelatinosa is in layers uh, two and layers three. The substantia gelatinosa. It's a more jelly-like layer. And it's this part of the dorsal horn. So that might be layer one there, layer two there, layer three there, four, five. The layers in the dorsal horn. Now the reason it's called the substantia gelatinosa is the tissue histiologically looks gelatinous. And uh, this is quite important because it's got these extra synapses in. And, and we'll see why this is important when we look at descending inhibition of pain. So the C fibres, there's interneurons and synapses in lamina layers two and three of the spinal cord, the substantia gelatinosa. But then it goes on up to the brain as before. Now when a C fibre comes up, there's actually branches from the C fibre and some branches from the C fibre go off to lower parts of the brain before they go to the thalamus. And these branches of the C fibres that go off to other parts of the brain, some of these branches from the C fibre go to the reticular formation in the midbrain and pons. And the reticular formation is important because that's what makes us conscious and keeps us awake, the, re the reticular system. So if there's a lot of pain going to the reticular system, that's going to activate the reticular system. And that's why patients in pain can't sleep. They can't get to sleep because their, their reticular system is activated. So this C fibre is coming up as normal, but branches are going off to the reticular system, meaning the patient is activated and awake. And other branches from the C fibres particularly go off to the limbic areas of the brain. Now the limbic areas of the brain are very primitive emotional centres. It's where a lot of our emotions come from. And when impulses, particularly from C fibres, go to limbic areas of the brain, that causes an emotional reaction to the brain. Uh, sorry, an emotional reaction to the pain, because pain is upsetting. So do remember this, when your patients are in pain, as well as having pain, they're also upset. Pain is upsetting, pain causes anxiety. And we know why. We know why. It's because nerve fibres go to limbic areas of the brain and cause that upset. Nerve fibres branch off and go to the reticular areas of the brain, making the patient unable to sleep. So <clears throat> the pain from the C fibres is in the lower part of the brain causing aches. The thalamus causes aches. But the pain's not as well localised. Now some C fibres do go on. They do synapse and some do go on to particular parts of the body. So we can know roughly where an ache is, but it's not as well localised as the sharp pains. So the C fibres are giving longer term, slower pain. It's achy. It's more diffuse. We don't know quite what part of the body is coming from. But that pain from the C fibres also stops our patients from sleeping and also causes upset. It's upsetting and distressing. So actually from this neurobiology, we can explain why there are pains, why how, how pain is localised by the body, why pain stops a patient sleeping, why pain causes distress and anxiety. These things can be explained by these pain pathways.